Hey guys and welcome to KMTV. In this video, I want to talk about how to build a stock portfolio. And in this video, I want to go through that topic by certain points. Because talking about building a stock portfolio is a rather complicated topic. You can expect that video to be rather long. And I would advise you to watch it totally through because otherwise it will make no sense. If you're not interested in that, just skip it and watch another video. We'll probably enjoy that more. For those who are interested in watching, let's just start straight ahead. One more thing to add, I'll split that video between me standing here and talking and also showing you pictures and graphs on, the, on my computer. So there will be a mixture between me standing and me talking on the screen. But with that said, let's actually start. So the first thing that we have to talk about is what kind of a portfolio do I want to build? Do I want to build growth stocks? Is the portfolio only with REITs, so real estate? Do I want to save for retirement? Do I want to save for my kids' college? So what kind of portfolio is that? And with that, do I have different approaches? Do I have an option trading portfolio where I have only cash, but I do buy a few options, sell options to make an income? So it's a rather tough question because depending on the answer, the portfolio has a lot of different options to go. In this video, I'll use a retirement portfolio because it's probably the easiest portfolio and especially the most important portfolio. As of today, today is April 28th, 2022. I'm 22 years old. So it's kind of weird to make me talk about retirement. If you want to retire, let's say with 60, 65, 62, 70, 50, depending on your age, you should have a certain amount of money that you can spend over the, let's say, last 30 years of your life to make sure that you won't get into any financial problems. Because I can tell you that being old and having financial problems is for sure not something that is pleasant or that is recommended by anyone who's not totally dumb. Another thing that is really important to stretch is when talking about a retirement portfolio. It is not, and I really want to stress that, not about becoming the next Bill Gates. It's about making sure that from the money you receive from your employer, or if you're independent, if you're an entrepreneur, the money that you receive on a monthly basis, from that money, you save a certain percentage, invest it into stocks, ETFs, whatever, but in for this video, only stocks and ETFs, with the goal to one day use the money as your retirement money. So you do not want to outperform the market, you just want to have a certain amount. So to make it clear again, crystal clear, you do not want to outperform the market, find the next Amazon or whatever, you just want to make sure that you have cash when you retire. For the next part, I'll talk about the return of stocks because often people overestimate the money they can make in the stock market and underestimate the money they can make if they just be patient but for that I'll go to the screen or I'll show you something on the internet show it to you on the screen whatever you want to call it and with that said, 
See you on the screen for this next part, the return of stocks. Hey guys, so let's go on. S&P 500 total and reflation adjusted returns. The first thing that I want to show you is, so this graph goes from 1950 to 2010, and it doesn't really matter that we are now in the year 2020, because I'll show you on another page in just a minute that the return does not really have any impact if you add the last 12 years. But the first thing that I want to show you is according to the S&P or to Standard & Poor's, the dividend component was responsible for 44% of total return of the last 80 years of the index. Because the first thing that I want to know, tell you is that if you take a look at, for example, the S&P 500, you only have a price return. So the dividends are not included in the return. So you only see the price of the S&P going up. But if you add the dividends, as shown here, you can see there's actually major difference in return because this is a logarithmic chart. And you can see now here, if this is one in 9050, we are here, let's say around, so this is 10, 20, I don't know, 50, maybe 60. But if we take a look, if we add the dividend, we can see we have a way higher return, especially if you reinvest the dividend, which is assumed in this reinvesting all the dividend produces about eight times the return than not investing the dividend. What does this mean for us? For us, it's very important to understand that if you are right now in the saving phase of your retirement, so not in the wasting phase of the money, so you would say you're 40 years old, you should choose an ETF where the dividends are automatically reinvested into that ETF. Or if you have an ETF or a stock that pays out a dividend to you, make sure that you reinvest the dividend because that gives you, as written down here, that quite larger return than not reinvesting dividend and using that money for, I don't know, french fries and coke. The next thing that I really want to stress is inflation and dividend distribution trends. What we can see is that especially here in the 1970s and the early 1980s, inflation was sky high. It was really sky high. Also, the dividend, so the annual dividend was at around 6%, for example, here in the year 1980 or 1979, definitely way higher than the rates are right now. I'll also show you a picture. Unfortunately, I don't have it right now, but I'll show it to you to you in a sec. So after I just showed you that over the long term, the dividends grow more than the than inflation. I want to finish that short part here where we talk about returns with inflation adjusted return. This line here shows that it's the nominal return. So the performance we see if we, for example, take a look at the SPY ETF. But this one here is the inflation adjusted return. And I really want to picture out this area here because if we go to trading view and then we type spy or spx and we use the monthly chart we can see that from 2000 august 2000 to october 2007 the the index pretty much stayed on the same level so nominal we are on the same level but we have to adjust it for inflation and if we go back to this picture we can see i'll zoom in in 2000 the index was higher than the index was in 2007 because we have to subtract the inflation from the index level and this is one thing people really really forget especially as it's written out down here as can be seen the stock market was very profitable in real terms in the 1950s to 1965 so in this area Yes, stock market was really profitable. And 83 
to few thousand is also true. So this has been a really profitable time. Actually, this time has been the best time in the stock market ever. On the other hand, it did not perform well from 65 to 83. And Nader did it for the last decade. Still during these periods, it virtually worked as a shelter from inflation. If we take a look here at 65, we can see that the index pretty much does the same as what I just explained. Here it's lower, yet here it's on the same level. So for the index to be inflation adjusted on the same level as this point, we have to go all the way to 1987. Yet, if we go back to the SPX, yeah, so we're going to this point at 66. So probably something, some point here. Yeah, so probably at this point here in 70, 1978, we would be nominal on the same level again. Sure, here and here and here we were above. But what I want to sh take a look at is inflation adjusted, what I just said. It took us way longer to be on the same level. And this leads to the fact that from 1950 to 2009, the total return was around 11 or was 11% per year. Inflation, 3.8% on average. And that leads to a real return of just 7% and not the expected 11%. And another quite amazing page is this one. So here you can see the investment result beats inflation during the period for an inflation adjusted return of about, so from 1900 to today, a hell lot of percent cumulative or 6.7% per year if you go for the inflation adjusted return up here which if, you, if you just press pause you can read it the nominal return is the roughly 10 percent so guys with that said now we talked about the real return and the nominal return let's go back to the camera hey guys so let's sum it up inflation definitely eats a lot of our performance so we have to do inflation adjustment if we want to calculate our returns. The second thing that I really would like to stress is the importance of dividends over the long term and how much that dividend reinvestment actually pays off. I'll just screenshot a small calculation of a 10 year period with dividend reinvestment and dividend not reinvested. With that said, Let's come to the next point. And the next point, single stocks versus the broad market. As you probably know, is that the vast majority of investors do underperform the broad market. So just a simple, stupid SPY ETF. I'll link an article by CNBC down in the info box. You can check it out. And that article again stresses that especially the longer the period is, the smaller the percentage numbers become where, first of all, their fund, so the actively managed fund, is still alive. Because if the fund does a terrible performance, then the fund is closed. So we have to take in survivorship bias in that calculation. And second of all, and second of all, we also have to look at the number of those who actually outperform the market. And we can see that's a super, super, super low number. Yet there are cases that definitely outperform the market over time. So take a look, for example, at Warren Buffett or John Schloss, I think he's called a friend of Warren Buffett. But also when we talk about Warren Buffett, take a look at the performance of Berkshire in the early years and at the performance, for example, from the beginning of the 2000s till now. In other words, as shown in this lovely Reddit post, guys, everything is priced in. And by everything being priced in, it's more or less randomness than our smart, super intelligent calculation analyzing of a stock whether we outperform the market with that stock or 
whether we do not. In other words, especially for retirement, we have to invest the largest portion of our retirement portfolio in a stupid buy and hold ETF of the broad market. SPY is a good example or the MSCI word, but to be honest, is showing in this page here if you do not invest in the United States you'll definitely look pretty dumb so you should invest in the United States and due to the fact that the SPY definitely performs better than the MCI word in my opinion you can take in consideration whether you want to put the majority of your investment into the SPY rather than the MCI but that's a topic for another video. And if you're interested in that, maybe consider subscribing. But please, only if you like the video. To sum it up till here, the second part. First of all, stocks perform quite good over the long term. For a retirement portfolio, it's really intelligent to invest in the broad market because no one can outperform the market. And your retirement portfolio is for your retirement not to become the next Bill Gates. So you do not want to mess anything up by speculating in some crazy stock that will probably be the next Amazon or most likely will fail. Let's start with the third point of this video. And the third point is income. For income, I use two countries. First of all, I'm going to show you a few German numbers. And then I'm going to show you a few United States numbers and finally I'll do an example for Germany where you can see what at the end of the month is still there after all expensive that you can actually save because that amount of money is very very important because it will probably surprise you what that number for Germany is and with that said Let's go back to the screen and see you in a sec, guys. Hey guys, so I want to start by taking a look at the average annual wages in Germany from 2000 to 2020 in euros. What we can see from the 2000s up to now, the average annual wages definitely increased over time. The last numbers we have are from 2020, and this is 42,593 euros. So let's say 42,600. And what we can see, especially since the financial crisis in 2008 and 9, the wages have increased by quite quite a lot. I mean, almost 6,000 euros or more than 6,000 euros a year in, I don't know, 10, 12, 13 years. It's quite solid. It's, I mean, it's one sixth of the wages back then. So all in all, quite quite good. Another thing that I want to take a look at is from here, let's take a look at the wages in the United States. And here we can see the median household income was $67,521. Really important to stress the dollars in 2020. And that's a decrease of roughly 3% from 2019 with the 69560 and one thing that I really want to stress is if you take a look at these numbers, they might seem high in the first place, but they aren't actually that high. And I'll show you why. If you take a look at that number, for example, let's say you look from, I don't know, let's say South Africa, that number may seem very, very high to you, yet you have to take in living expenses that are way more expensive in Germany and the United States than, for example, in South Africa. Another thing that I want to show you is if you take a look at how many people in Germany earn more than 100,000 euros. So this is our all employees. So everyone in Germany who pays taxes only. So if we add those numbers, we get so that plus that is 3%, 5, 6, round about 6%. So we can say that 94% of the people in Germany earn less than 100,000 
and this is before taxes, less than 100,000. Because one thing that people often tell you is, yeah, so one of my friends, he earns like so much and blah, 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 blah. No, it's actually not. Actually, only a really small amount of people earn more than 100,000 euros in Germany. If we take a look at the US, sure, here the number is way higher with 34%, which is way, 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 way higher than in Germany. But yet, taking a look at the, for example, average home price in the United States, which is sky high at 400 with 28,000, that isn't that much money actually, is it? I mean, especially, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any data if you take a look at where this income is made. So let's say, for example, in, in New York City, it isn't actually that much in New York City, is it? And another thing that I want to stress really is you often hear that, okay, I just found a company, I do a startup, I'll do a side hustle. Yeah, right. A side hustle. A side hustle is the important thing because if we take a look at that website, how many startups fail? In 2019, the failure rate of startup was around 90%. Reach research includes 21% of startups fail in the first year, 30% in the second year, 50% in the fifth year, and 70% in their 10th year. And this is really interesting because nowadays you often hear like, ah, oh, I become self-employed. I'll just build some kind of online business as I want to do it on my channel. Yet most of them don't assume that first of day they will fail. And that at the end of the day, they might actually have a better time being employed than owning a business. Because being employed at a proper employer will definitely give you financially most likely a higher return than building up your own startup. Sure, if you reach that goal eventually of having a business with more than 500 employees, you certainly have made it, yes, but the percentage is not higher than those who make it. And you aren't that special that you are the 10%. We always assume we are the 10%. I mean, again, I want to do an online business and I want to show you more about the chat here in the channel. Unfortunately, I can't do that yet because I haven't done so much yet, but it has other reasons. I'm aware that I'll most likely fail because I am not very special. I am not a genius. I am not the most entrepreneur in the world and i think that the 10 or 15k that i'll spend on the idea with my girlfriend together will most likely go bust and that's rather sad unfortunately it's only a side hustle because if you are able to save because all of the money is consumed by your startup we're talking about that tough time in retirement where you maybe do not have any money with that said let's go into a straight example this is the german statistics whatever ministry thing you call it. Here we can see that a one person, so a single person household, does spend approximately 1,600 euros per month on all kinds of things. And they assume that renting is only 680, but be sure renting is actually quite higher. This is one thing I think that number should be higher because I know so many people that definitely spend more than that on a single rent. But again, here we're talking about region. Where do you live in Germany? Where do you live in the United States? In the whole video, you can't apply what I'm saying one-to-one -to, -one to your situation. You have to calculate it into one's, your situation. With that said, 1,600. Please keep that number in, in mind. Monthly expensive. This here is a calculation tool that shows you the before tax income and then the after tax income. And I so 42,000 is roughly... 3,500 per month. Um, so you're single. You are as I am, let's say 24. No, I'm not 25. But let's just say you are 25. You're not a member of the church because if you are a member in the of the church in Germany, you have to pay extra taxes. And you end up with 2,279 euros per month. 500 in taxes and 711 in social expenses. By the way, I think it's a shit show. From that number, we subtract the 1,600. So we end up with 679 euros left to spend 
on a monthly base. Sure, some of that money already went to retirement, but the German retirement system is going to go bust soon. That's why you need to do a private thing. With that number, with these 600 79 bucks we go to an etf calculation tool and we say from that money we want to spend 300 a month all through i have to really stress that i think most households with that income that i've just showed you not gonna be saving 300 bucks because then you only would end up with 380 bucks a month for cinema holiday food spending time with your friends or other things. Let's say we use a 300 bucks and we have to pay 1.5% per month for from that as a fee for the broker, or whatever. Uh, per year, we have 0.4% cost, which is quite likely as a fee for an ETF. And we take that inflation adjusted return of 7%. Now we do the calculation. And after 40 years, so if you're 20, you can do that. You end up with a lovely almost 700,000 euros for retirement, inflation adjusted. And I would assume you can live with that. So you are capable of building a small fortune because to be honest, in nowadays money, 700,000 bucks isn't that much. You are able to build a small fortune over your lifetime. For retirement, as a one single person, it will probably be enough, most likely. So let's say you want to use 150 bucks, not these 300s, because you want to, well, spend a certain amount of money on, I don't know, your, your life. You want to go hang out with friends, want to do like a big holiday once in a while, whatever. And suddenly you only end up with 350,000. And 350,000, well, it's still all right, but over 30 years, for retirement, that's tough. And now let's do something else. Let's say you're not 20, but you're already 30 and you can only save for 30 years instead of 40. Well, then you only end up with 170,000. Oh, well, so that's quite tough. In other words, what I want to say is, if you take a look at these numbers, I hope you already noticed that in your retirement portfolio, it's not about becoming Bill Gates. It's about making sure that you have money at all if you are about to go retire. Let's say you were actually able to do the 300 bucks and you had 30 years. So you, so you ended up with 335,000. Now we have that in our stock portfolio. Now we have to take in something very, very important into consideration. And this is retire nest egg calculator. So how long will your retirement nest egg? This thing basically does run thousands of simulations on the stock market performance over 30 years and see how likely it is that your savings will last. And let's say we need 30 years of saving and we have 350,000 bucks. Oh no, 330,000 bucks. And how much money do we need? Let's say we need in nowadays money, these $1,600. So in a year, around about $18,000. Well, with that combination, we can see it won't work. Let's do all in stocks. And we can still see there's only a 71% probability that our money will last that amount of time. And that's low. But why is there only 71% probability? I'll show you. Here we go in trading view again. Take a look at the SPX. And we say all our money is invested in the SPX. And we go into retirement exactly at that point. And then that happens. We still have to get money from our portfolio every month. We need money every month for our living. If we come into retirement here and the market does only go up for the next, I don't know how many years, well, that's good. But if we go into retirement here, first of all, our portfolio is only worth about, is only worth about half. So in our calculation, only $160,000. And if you take have $160,000, you take 18,000 away. That's a hell of money. It's not 5% of the saving. It's more, way more. It's 10% or 11%. And well, the market's already down 50%. Now you take away another 10%. Well, that's tough for your portfolio. What I want to say is you have to go down on that thing because let's say you go to 9%. 
R2 9000 to 2.7 percent then it would work and I would not do that simulation or plan my retirement with less than 95 percent otherwise you're done with that said let's go back to the camera and finish the video hey guys so now we're done um i hope you liked the video so far let's sum it up first of all we've noticed especially in the last part of the video that with our retirement portfolio we should not really do crazy things we should make sure that we buy the most simple etf on a broad market like the msci world or the spx another thing that we've noticed is that even if we have a low income, a low monthly expense, we should make sure that we save enough for retirement or for its tough. It's really, really tough. And we've also noticed that if we aren't quite young, the performance that we'll have or the amount of money we'll have at the end of our investment career it is definitely has a big difference and I'm quite happy that most of my viewers are between 20 and 30 so we are all still in at an age where we can lay the foundation of our retirement and we've also noticed at the beginning of the video that especially the reinvestment of dividend makes a really really big difference in investing Guys, for retirement, just buy a simple ETF on the MSCI World or the SPI. Do as much as you can per month. Use a simple ETF calculator to make sure that you have inflation adjusted. A certain amount of money where you would save over a long period of time you calculate it with that one good simulator that gives you all different variants of how the market can perform I'm safe because none of us wants to live in poverty when we're retired with that said I hope you enjoyed the video guys if you watched it so far I'm super thankful for that I'm super thankful for the support and see you soon Bye.